Um, good morning, everybody, and welcome to the Employment and Skills Convention. My name is Stephen Evans, and I'm the Chief Executive of the Learning and Work Institute. Um, we've been running these conventions for 20 years uh, now, and some of you I know will have been um, to all of them. Um, and this, everyone's different in their own way, but this one's particularly different, I think, for um, two main reasons. So the first is that, um, as you will all have noticed, we're online this year rather than in person. Um, and clearly that means that everything looks and feels a little bit different and we don't get the chance to mix and mingle um, in some of the ways that we have done um, in the past. Um, but actually it gives us an opportunity, or lots more people, opportunities to attend um, who might otherwise have been able to, to spare the time and to get out of the um, office. So I think we've got more than 1,200 people registered for this event via Zoom and YouTube. Um, and so that's, the, in fact, the largest number of people we've ever had in the whole 20 year history of the convention registered and um, able to attend. So it's great that we've got so many people um, taking part um, in this event. Um, so um, a couple of bits of um, housekeeping before I go on to the second reason why this convention's a little bit uh, different. Um, so first of all, if you're on Twitter, please do um, tweet away and use the hashtag employment skills 20. Um, so tweet away via that. You can give your comments. You can also ask um, questions for the speakers and we'll, we'll pick those um, up and collate them together. Um, also, um, you should have had the, the, the link and the code to Slido in advance. So we'll be running a few polls during the course of the event. So if you go to slido.com and then the event code is 5099, um, then you can take part in various polls there. You can also ask um, questions that we can put to the speakers as well. So please do um, uh, click on to Slido and the event code is 5099. The first poll is actually um, currently live on there. Um, so you can, uh, lots of you have already been voting away, um, but please do uh, click onto that and vote on the first question, which is um, about the, um, the statement that the Chancellor made yesterday, um, where there were a lot of measures to help people, um, Britain get back to work. Um, and we'll be talking about those, of course, during the course of today. And what we want to know is whether um, you think that actually those measures will be enough um, to get Britain back to work, whether they're a good start, but we need to do more, or whether actually um, they're not going to make that much difference and we need to do a lot, lot more very, very quickly. Um, so please do um, click in um, and vote on that poll and also um, start putting your um, uh, Q's and A's in there too. Um, so that's the first bit of housekeeping. Um, I also um, wanted to um, say a big thank you to the sponsors of the event for helping to make it happen, um, in particular to um, our lead sponsor, Stay Nimble, and to the Digital College, Clarion Futures, the Palladium Group, and Cognisoft. Um, all of that support helps to make the convention happen, and particularly um, when it's something like this year where we've had to change the format uh, very, very quickly um, and, uh, and, and sort of respond quite rapidly to the changing circumstances. So thank you um, for their support. Um, so I mentioned one reason why the convention's um, different this year, um, because we're, we're virtual and online. Um, I guess the second reason um, is because of the economic circumstances that we are in. Um, and the research we've done shows that the impact of coronavirus on the labour market has been profound. Um, 
and the measures taken um, to protect public health. Um, so in the last couple of months, claimant unemployment has uh, doubled. Um, we've had uh, sharp rises in particular for uh, low paid workers, for young people, and the sharpest rises in unemployment in areas where it was already highest. So we've had a, a big shock to the labour market um, and it's been unequally distributed. Um, and we saw a, a, a seven-fold increase, I think, in universal credit claims in the early part of the crisis. And I think DWP did a fantastic job in redeploying 10,000 staff to um, get uh, those claims processed um, on time uh, and to make sure people got the money that they needed, as well as all the uh, initial emergency measures that the government took to help businesses uh, and people. Um, and then uh, today's event is, is spectacularly well-timed, which I'd like to put entirely down to planning uh, by us, but uh, it's, it's happenstance to an extent, uh, I'd have to admit, um, in that yesterday the Chancellor made his uh, statement and announced a, a large list of measures to get the economy going and to get people back to work. Um, and I know that um, our ministerial speakers will talk about some of those, so I won't steal their, their thunder on this um, right away. But I think there was really lots to welcome in terms of ramping up employment support and more Job Centre Plus work coaches in terms of um, um, creating job placements uh, for young people, trying to get the economy going and creating jobs through retrofitting and other things like that. Um, and, and lots more besides. So there was a lot in there and, and, and a lot that, that we, and I'm sure many um, on this uh, event would welcome as well. Um, so as I say, I won't go into too many details because I don't want to steal um, the Minister's um, thunder on this. And we will have a discussion during the Q&A as well about how some of these things will work and what else should we be looking at? What else do we need to do? But I think my um, central point for this convention is that the scale of this crisis is so huge that it's far better to overreact in the policy response than underreact. Um, in general, um, even if the economy bounces back, it usually takes employment about three to seven years to recover uh, from recessions based on the experience of the past three recessions. So it's gonna take some time. We're, we're gonna have particular groups affected. We're gonna have increases in long-term unemployment and we need to really throw the kitchen sink at it to prevent long-term damage for our economy um, and for people's uh, livelihoods as well. So I'd far, ra far rather overreact um, than underreact, I think. So that's my starting point. Um, but again, we'll get into some of the debate about that. Others may have a view that we'll bounce back more quickly and, and hence um, uh, we don't need such a, such a rapid response or such a uh, fulsome response. Um, so I guess that's kind of my take on the, the context um, and I think we should probably get straight on um, to um, the keynote speakers and we're really, really pleased to have um, a, a ministerial double act this morning um, and I think that kind of shows both the importance of the labour market response to, to get people back to work and to improve skills but also how closely um, uh, the Department of Education and the Department of Work and Pensions are working together because we do need a joined up response to what is a very profound crisis. So we're delighted to welcome both of our ministerial speakers. Um, so um, first up is going to be uh, Nims uh, Davis, who's the uh, Employment Minister, who's going to talk about some of those uh, measures I'm sure that I mentioned um, were announced uh, yesterday and that the DWP has already taken. Um, and then secondly, we're going to hear from Gillian Keegan, the Minister for Apprenticeships and Skills, to talk about the role of further education and apprenticeships and other things like that in promoting um, recovery. We're going to hear from both of them first, and then we're going to, to sort of do a, a, a short Q&A session. So as I say, please do keep your questions coming via Slido and also via Twitter, and we'll collate them together and do keep voting in the poll as well. Um, but without further ado, I shall now um, attempt, assuming I've got my technology correct, um, to hand across to the Employment Minister, Mims Davis.
I think we're on. <laughs> good morning, Stephen, and good morning, everyone. And thank you very much for that kind uh, opening and, and those thoughts, which were already very interesting as we, we start this brilliant event. And, and I'd like to start by thanking all the speakers for being part of today, as well as the Learning and Work Institute for inviting me to their annual Employment and Skills Convention, which has been going for a number of years. And, and it's wonderful for us to have this timing to explore these many challenges and opportunities that we do have ahead of us with uh, people from a wide range of, of organisations, a huge number. Now, this, as we know, comes at a time which is exciting, but yes, extremely challenging. And following the announcement of our plan for jobs by the Chancellor yesterday, this is very key for us to be discussing. Now, one of the things he crystallised was just how important it is for the government private and voluntary organisations to pull together as we move into this recovery. And we all have to do this. And how are we going to do this? Because we need to build on what the government's already done. And the government has paid the wages of millions of people, supporting them through the recent months of the pandemic. And we now will pay a bonus to employers uh, for every employee getting back into work. Now, this is vital uh, because we have our new people, uh, young people focused uh, kickstart scheme, which will build on the, all the work that we've already done. And we'll need employers to help create good quality jobs with the wages subsidised again by the government. And this is a massive injection of two billion pounds. Now, our sector based work academies, which will be increasing, rely on these local partnerships between job centres and employers. This supports our DWP place-based approach, which is crucial, which will help businesses both find and fill uh, their vacancies, but also with the right people who have the right skills. And of course, life as we know it has massively changed in the last few months. In fact, since I met some of you earlier this year, we are currently living in a world full of social distancing, filled with virtual meetings, where remembering to unmute our microphone is seemingly an impossible task. We're under heavy scrutiny over our bookcases and our backdrops. And I know you're doing that right now. Uh, Stephen's just moved. He's got his bookcase very sorted, I think. So for many of us, life has changed because our kitchen tables and our spare room desks are now our new offices. And we are presented with barriers and opportunities uh, to work, which we just simply haven't faced before. And the world of work has changed for many, and we've had to adapt according to, and the reality is, accordingly, and the reality is we're gonna have to continue to do that. So this is a very challenging time for many people. There is truly uncertainty in different sectors of the economy, concerns about job prospects, and the overarching long-term impact of the coronavirus, as we heard from Stephen. Now, if we take a look back to where we were before this health emergency struck and we entered lockdown, we had seen a record number of people in work. And the number of those out of work was at its lowest since the mid-1970s at 3.9% unemployment. Now, this is a record I'm incredibly proud of and an achievement that has changed the course of people's lives. But it's also one that's reflected the strong foundations of our labour market and one that we simply must now build back. That's why back in March, the government's immediate first steps were wide ranging and focused on ensuring people received support as quickly as possible, protecting businesses and most importantly, supporting people's livelihoods as widely as possible. Now, the DWP ministerial team and I are overwhelmingly proud of our role that DWP staff played in this, working so hard to ensure people had the support they needed. Our job centres crucially remained open throughout the pandemic to support the most vulnerable, with over 10,000 staff redeployed into the front line 
uh, processing claims. So just to give you an idea of the numbers of since March, our staff have processed uh, 2.5 million universal credit claims and made over 1 million advance payments so people can access money and support quicker. And I'm sure you've heard the word unprecedented more times than you'd care to remember over the last few months. But these numbers for DWP truly are. They are record breaking. And that's why our DWP work to progress just isn't finished. We must press on with the same speed and intention that we have done since this pandemic started. And at the core of what the Chancellor said yesterday was a clear plan for supporting and creating and protecting jobs and doing so for every part of the country, giving businesses the boost of confidence they need both to retain and hire people while providing individuals with the key tools that they need to get better jobs and crucially progress. I'm incredibly proud of the role that DW played already and will be playing in the next stage of our recovery. Now, to deal with that sheer scale of challenge we've just faced and the challenges yet to come, we're investing uh, £895 million to double the number of our work coaches in our job centres. And that's by March 2021. And I can tell you, I've already had people expressing interest, and that's brilliant. Now, that's another 13,500 people joining our dedicated, hardworking staff, the ones that we already have. And they'll be focusing on how to help people back into work, to pivot into new roles, and help crucially revive the jobs market. Now, back at the end of April, we launched a new targeted employment campaign, Job Help and Employer Help, to match job seekers with the businesses who were recruiting to help keep those who may find themselves out of work connected to the jobs market. Now, in particular, for those ready and able and wanting to work, we promoted roles which were vital in helping to keep Britain going. For example, positions in health, social care, supermarkets, agriculture and food production. Now, this campaign has boosted DWP's digital presence and this hugely benefits everyone in terms of accessibility. Our newly launched job help site really kicked in to help provide job seekers and employers with advice, showing people what roles were out there and crucially offering guidance on upskilling or pivoting into new roles. And we've already engaged with our new job seekers, making over 250,000 outbound phone calls each week, an astronomical number which has helped guide people through their work search. It's provided personalised advice straight away. And this routine of support has helped many to start to bridge the gap and prepare for the new world of work as lockdown eases. Now, this was rooted in the expert support we've always provided and helped people to adjust in the ever-changing labour market. And going forward, we must maximise employment, minimise scarring from the long term unemployment work that we do to helping keep the labour market operating and going stronger into this recovery. Now, as I said, our labour market was resilient beforehand and it's on this foundation that we built our plan for jobs, which will help get Britain back to work. And we want to return to the record numbers that we saw before the pandemic, which importantly included more women, more ethnic minority workers than ever before. And we'd nearly halved youth unemployment. Impressive achievements. And I want us to strive towards fixing them and fixing the barriers to progress about so that we don't go backwards. And this has always been a priority for me in this role. And it was fully reflected in the Chancellor's announcement yesterday, which I was pleased to see had a strong focus on our young people, ensuring that no generation will be left behind. And I'm hugely passionate about tackling youth unemployment, as this benefits communities across the UK. 
I love listening and hearing from our young people who have so much to give and our and they are our future. And it's why it's an area in this government I've absolutely pushed for us to have a clear focus on. And that's why we'll be launching at DWP a huge new youth offer for all 18 to 24 year olds making a claim to universal credit who are in the intensive work search group. Because I recognize that young people are understandably worried, not only in terms of employment, but how their future prospects may look and also the potential wider implications on their ambitions to own a home, to have a family and know what their financial future really looks like. Now, this builds on the department's existing offer for our young people. And through our newly announced DWP Youth Hubs, we can improve our outreach, while those who need a little bit more help can access it from our new army of youth employment coaches, work coaches. Now, they're going to be based locally, they're going to be rooted in their communities, and they're going to be providing targeted support. With six youth hubs announced in Birmingham just this week, and that's all part of a new package of key employment measures. Now, as I mentioned yesterday, uh, saw the start of Kickstart. This is a new and powerful programme that I've been really excited to work up the policy on. I've been on a lot of Zooms on this. And we're making sure we don't just give young people a job, that we fully open up opportunity. Now, as part of this, we'll be working closely with employers, driving private sector involvement and pushing forward for those high quality roles. Everyone here today will, I hope, want to be part of this and more information about how to do so will be published very soon. So please do watch out for it and please be ready to get involved because it's so important that we don't just focus on one group. We have a duty to support all job seekers so that they can get back to the security of a regular pay packet. So we've announced that we're also going to be investing £95 million into expanding our work and health programme, as well as developing a new large scale support offer. This will be targeted at those who are out of work for longer periods, who do need that further support and who may face those additional barriers. Meanwhile, £150 million will boost our crucial flexible support fund to allow our job centres to put in place the support that's right for their community, including a rapid response service that can be deployed for any large scale redundancies. This government has a plan for jobs and it's a gigantic investment at £30 billion to help revive our labour market and turn us onto the road to recovery and making thousands of personal stories of renewal uh, and opportunities the legacy of this pandemic. Now, I'm someone who has job hopped a lot. I freely admit that from uh, working in a yogurt factory to being a radio presenter to selling pages. Somebody, some of you might remember them and mobile phones. But I can vouch that every job I've had has been an important stepping stone into building transferable skills and crucially confidence in a long term career goals. And that's what I want for everybody. The one thing I've learned from my experience is where you start won't necessarily be where you finish. Now, with this in mind, focusing alongside uh, Gillian and other departments, we are looking at focus on upskill and pivoting and giving everybody that right support because it's so crucial in driving our economy forward and inspiring that vital confidence for both individuals and businesses to push this recovery forward. And as I say, I'm extremely proud of what our department's already done so far. Our support is ramping up and we're going to be putting job centres and our offer at the heart of our response. It's their abilities at the heart of our communities which will help keep DWP at the forefront of this UK government's response. 
But as I've said before, we cannot do it alone. We must all work together. And the DWP is working very closely with employers, with providers, with the Department for Education, with BAEs, with local authorities across local governments and with charities and other partners to deliver this comprehensive support package. And that's why this level of commitment and support, I have no doubt, will help us get us through the challenge together and we can look ahead with the optimism that we need because once this virus has been beaten we want our country to get back up and running at full speed and it's by supporting people that this will power us all forward thank you very much great thank you mims and i i, I really wish i'd spent a bit more time arranging those books in a different order to make me look a bit cleverer than i am now but never mind next one um, there's a lot in there, but that's because the, the, the government has announced such a lot and just yesterday quite a lot of it as well. So there's lots to get our teeth stuck into and lots of questions coming through in particular about the kickstart scheme um, and then also about adults and reskilling and, and retraining and things like that. So what, I, what we will do is just hold on to those questions um, and uh, hear from uh, Gillian first and then we'll bring some of those questions and others that come through. Uh, first and just before I pass over to Gillian just the last call to uh, vote in the Slido poll which will be closing off in about five minutes or so. Um, so Gillian we're really pleased to, to have, have you here this morning um, and I'll pass straight across to you to, to talk about uh, your, your response and your department's response. Thank you very much Stephen. As you see I've got a blank wall behind me um, so I don't know what that says about me. It's actually uh, my office in the DfE and uh, I haven't been here long enough I think to uh, to collect anything but do th thank you very much for um, inviting me to join you. It is a, a pleasure to uh, to join your annual uh, employment and skills convention and I do look forward to coming hopefully one day in person. Um, as the Minister for Apprenticeship and Skills, obviously I very much welcome uh, the focus uh, that the Chancellor's speech had yesterday on young people and a very broad offer to young people to help wherever you are, whatever stage you are, to try and help you um, well, to first of all, to minimise the impact of youth unemployment, but to help you get a valuable opportunity into the workplace. Um, apprenticeships is, is obviously something that uh, was at the heart, uh, as well as traineeships and the ability to study further. Um, but I'm very um, much focused on um, the, the apprenticeship route myself. Um, I started work in, in, in age 16 in the 80s, and the 80s was also a very difficult time for young people to access the workplace. And apprenticeships were seen as really the, uh, the best way, the, the, the most solid opportunity really to get um, some valuable work experience. And, you know, clearly that was at the, 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 the heart of, of trying to uh, encourage high quality, secure and fulfilling employment. So there's a new payment, everyone will have seen £2,000, that wasn't available at the time uh, in the 80s, but uh, £2,000 to employers uh, for each new apprentice that's hired under the age of 25. And for those over 25, because we do see that the apprenticeship route is not only a great route to build a career into the workplace but it's also a great route to retrain and we do have um, a rather substantial numbers of people over the age of 25 uh, and into their 30s and 40s who also use this route to retrain and to move into other careers or, or perhaps get the first shot of a career um, if they went into a, a job straight from work and haven't been able to uh, upskill or move uh, after that. So that uh, will also include £1,500 payment uh, for each new apprentice that's hired over 25 over the age of 25 and this is a very quick it's from available from the 1st of August so one of the other uh, things that we've been really trying to grapple with here is this this um, this whole unprecedented uh, recession that we're, 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 we're in or we're, we're, we're about to uh, see the, the nature of is, is completely uh, almost come out of the blue, you know, usually get some more notice. So we have to be able to work and act very quickly. And that's why MIMS, myself, Bayes, we've been working very closely together to try and get things that we can action very quickly. So that will be available from the 1st of August uh, through to uh, January 2021. Uh, we've also put a focus on traineeships because not everybody um, is ready for apprenticeships and 
We have found that traineeships uh, do work. They are a successful way of getting people employment ready, getting people the opportunity to get some work experience and to meet those valuable contacts and to um, just learn really more about the world of work and often go on then to an apprenticeship route. So we're also focused on uh, traineeships, um, which will, will triple the number, three times more funding has been provided uh, to providers um, to make sure that young people who are not in a position to take on an apprenticeship can also get the opportunity to get that valuable work experience. Many of us will have heard in our lifetime, or certainly will have heard it applied to others, that catch-22, you know, how do you build work experience when the opportunities aren't there? And the real focus on youth unemployment and avoiding that is because we know that if somebody, a young person is not employed and they are not in education training um, or employment for a period of time, it's, re it's really temporary. So we need to make sure we give people, as Mim said, the confidence that they can um, get on in the workplace and traineeships are a great way of building that experience but also that confidence. We're also going to be offering uh, for those that um, are not uh, looking to enter the workplace but want to study and continue their studies. We're offering um, 18 and 19 year old school and college leavers the opportunity to study high value uh, courses at, uh, at levels two and three um, when if, if, if the if there isn't an opportunity to start an apprenticeship um, and a traineeship is not uh, is not the right role for them. So there are more details to come in a few weeks. But what we try to focus on there is those those areas, those skills that are going to be valuable for future employment. One of the unusual aspects of, of where we are right now is four months ago when I started this job, the first couple of weeks, I was talking about skills gaps and skills shortages in quite a lot of sectors of our economy. And we've gone from, as Mim says, a very, very um, low um, unemployment to this position and, and very high skills gaps to this position where the whole thing has shifted very, very quickly. But we still know that we will uncover those skills gaps. We still know that there are big gaps in our economy and we want young people to make sure, we wanna make sure we guide young people to the areas where there is opportunity and there is gonna be continued opportunity. So we're also investing more in the careers service to make sure people get that valuable advice. If you're looking to get the right skills, what are the future skills? that employers need, what uh, are the skills that they will value in uh, next year, the year after, the year after that. So we guide people to make sure that they are studying those things that will make them valuable in the workplace. So in, in total, we've got obviously a, a vast package, which is going to include wherever you are, at whatever stage, access focused on trying to get employment uh, opportunities. We've obviously got training also as part of the work-based sector academies. Then we've got traineeships, apprenticeships, and full-time study, if none of those are available um, for you. So hopefully that will be something that um, will really give young people a, a range of opportunities uh, starting from August and September this year. So very uh, quick, we have obviously have to be uh, moved very quickly. Another thing, uh, September is always a busy month in, in education, but another thing that we have uh, done over this period is pushed ahead with T-levels. I don't know how many people are aware of T-levels, but they are the biggest reform to technical education um, post-16 um, since A-levels were first introduced 70 years ago. We've long been trying to, 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 to shorten, um, to, to, to reduce the gap between what people study and what the workplace wants. It kind of is the holy grail in a way to make sure that we work as closely enough with employers across the country to make sure that we can anticipate what the skills are that they will need in the future. And the way we've been focusing on that has been T-levels. And we've worked with around 300 employers um, representing many different sectors, and they have helped us design and develop this new technical qualification. It is effectively the inverse of an apprenticeship. Instead of um, a full-time job where you study um, one day a week or 20% of your time and you work 80% of your time, it's the inverse of that. So you are a full-time student, you are studying uh, more or less 80% of your time and 20% of your time you're getting work experience. Again, that valuable work experience. So the first three of those are going to be introduced in September, one in digital, uh, which the whole, every sector is crying out for digital skills. And of course we all know why. Um, there is also one in, in, in construction that's building and design 
designing uh, construction. So it's got a lot of uh, the, the digital skills you also need in the construction industry. And the other is in education and childcare. Again, huge skills gaps, huge vacancies in that area. So we're focusing on those and we're very excited that we've got more than 40 uh, FE providers and uh, we are now recruiting and we've got um, a lot of young people who are signing up to do those courses. And really what that is, it enables them to get a head start on, on career-led study. They know what careers they're, they're interested in, in terms of those broad areas, and they'll study and they'll get that valuable work experience, which will allow them to either go on to a higher level apprenticeship, enter the workplace, or study further in this area. So that's something we're very excited about, a meaningful industry placement, but that's something we're also asking employers to do at this same time. Um, of course, the world of work is changing. It's it's always changing. I've worked for 30 years before becoming an MP in various industries all over the world and I've seen many tech changes. Tech changes in an industry, uh, and we've seen now this acceleration of the use of digital. It's It's been there for a while, but it's been massively accelerated by coronavirus, by necessity, by need. And everybody has had to change, including this conference, obviously, and adapt the way we work. When you have those technology shifts, there are opportunities and there are opportunities specifically for young people who are digital natives, but we need to make sure that they get the right uh, skills that, that employers are valuing. So that's really what we've been focusing on um, for many, many, um, well, for, for, for a couple of years now. So we're delighted to bring that to the fore. One of the other things we've done during coronavirus and particularly when people were furloughed uh, we've introduced the skills toolkit and that was something we did very quickly again with a number of uh, employers in the tech space to say okay what are the skills that you really value and we've offered a number of short courses from two weeks to 12 weeks they're all free um, they're all available on the skills toolkit about 17 courses and they were there to enable people to use their time to basically uh, imp improve their employability whether you're a graduate whether you're whatever stage you are whatever age you are and i would encourage people to um to encourage others to know that this is there it's been it's been stood up very quickly and thanks very much to all of our tech partners who've helped us do that as well as the ou and others um, we've had more than 400,000 uh, tracked page views and we've got more than 136,000 people who've actually uh, started courses that are featured on the site already and that's just been in the last couple of months. As well as this, we have an ongoing program of investing in further education. Um, myself, I went to a further education college and they're always seen as massive uh, tools of social mobility and they are, they're rooted in place, they're there. If you're an apprentice as I was, you go one day a week, some others go full time and they've always been very good at um, technical skills and that has become um, the technical skills have become much much more valuable in the workplace so it's recognized that we really want to focus on building up our further education sector so we've been investing and will continue to invest in the real estate in um, the capital equipment um, and we're also investing in institutes of technology which are a great collaboration between FE colleges, universities and key businesses to really focus on those higher level technical skills to make sure that uh, young people can um, well, learn, learn the future skills that, that, that employers are demanding. So we've invested in state-of-the-art equipment, there's 12 of those uh, that are being rolled out at the moment and then there'll be more to come. And so in line with our manifest commitment we've obviously uh, invested up nearly 300 million in this and we'll also be investing in the real estate of FE colleges as well uh, and that's been announced 1.5 billion of which we're now accelerating trying to bring some of those forward for the other part of the Chancellor's speech which is really to create jobs create those jobs in construction in infrastructure in all the things that we wanted to do but now we're going to bring them forward um, so we've got a, a lot of focus on improving I, I look at some of the things we're doing and think thank thank goodness we did start a lot of this earlier thank goodness we started really working very closely with employers so that we were building the technical qualifications of the future we were building the institutions of the future we were investing in the right things so that people could study and get the skills of the future and now they they will be very valuable in every setting whether it's part of a workplace um, um, sector-based um, academy the training part of that whether it'll be a traineeship 
the training part of that, whether it's an apprenticeship as well. So we do have uh, investments that I think will stand us in good stead so that young people can come out the other side of this with very valuable skills that will allow them to progress um, uh, at a, a, a hopefully an accelerated pace due to the digital skills, the technical skills that they will have that will serve them well in the future. Thank you. Great, thank, thank you, Gillian. Um, there's so much to get um, stuck into um, there from both of your um, speeches. Um, I'm, I'm conscious of uh, uh, time and the fact that we need to let both of you go as well. Um, um, but I wonder if I can maybe just ask you each one, uh, one quick question from some of the questions that have come through via the, um, via the chat function. Um, so Mims, um, for you, I guess there's been a number of questions about the Kickstart scheme in particular and when that's going to get up and running and how local partners and others can, can get involved. So if I can maybe ask that of you and Gillian, uh, then secondly to you, um, I know you talk, talked about adults a number of times during your, your speech there, but there's a number of questions saying, you know, the stuff for young people is obviously front and centre and really important, but maybe what, what about the importance of adults retraining and upskilling as well? So, so maybe if I can secondly just put, put that to you in terms of the response there. But first, first across to Mims, please. Thank you, Stephen. Um, in regard to, to Kickstart, um, there was a very genuine plea just now. If you want to get involved, you've got some ideas, now is the chance because uh, we've been securing the funding, we've been working up, our policy is nearly there and it's very much about that public, private and voluntary sector coordination to, to get those placements right uh, and to make sure that we maximise the opportunity for the participants and the employers. Uh, so we're just working up the the next bits of the details of the scheme so there's a chance to get in quick if you've got any ideas i want to use the social value act as well uh, and very much um build in a local based solution so all of this is being done at the moment uh, and we're, we're still at the the finalizing stage so if you think we might miss anything let us know because you might get in with it but we're, we're learning from what we've done before we're looking at the picture that we've got now and we're determined to to come forward with something which works across the country, place-based, and really changes people's opportunities. Thank you, Mims, and, and over to you, Gillian. Uh, thanks. I mean, of course, it is vital that, um, particularly as we're, we're shifting as well in terms of some of the skills that are required in our economy, some of the jobs that employ a lot of people today will not um, employ as many people tomorrow. So we're absolutely focused on that. So the first thing is everybody in the country has now got an entitled to a digital entitlement. So we have introduced a, a, a digital course which is available to everybody. And that's new and that's available from September. All age apprenticeships, I'm very much a fan of that. Everybody I meet, I've, I've I've heard some very inspiring stories from people who just didn't get the shot first time round quite often and going to a comprehensive school in Knowsley uh, for, for, for my education I understand that that does happen and I've certainly seen that happen myself so all age apprenticeships and there's some some brilliant examples and they will be incentivized and they are also available and then of course we've got uh, the skills uh, toolkit um, the Secretary of State for, for Education is, is going to be doing an important speech later on today and he's really going to be focusing on the skills that our economy needs to really drive uh, the productivity that we need in our economy, which is actually another thing we were focused on uh, really uh, before coronavirus. So he's going to be uh, setting out his vision in much more detail later today. So I think that's another thing for, for everybody here to, if they don't get a chance to, to listen to it live, uh, they can catch up on, on that as well, because he's, uh, he's going to be spelling out how we offer for everybody in our economy the ability to upskill and reskill and to really uh, make sure that we have the right skills across the country. Great, thank you. So an, an open offer to come forward with your ideas to DWP and a speech to watch this afternoon from the, uh, the Education Secretary as well. Um, we, to be honest, we could have spent a lot more than two hours just talking about um, with both of you about the, the government response and all, all those announcements yesterday um, as well. Um, but we're, we're, I'm very grateful for you both for sparing the time this morning to talk about this and for everybody who's kind of pitched in questions where I've tried to sort of corral them together into, into a couple of themes. I think there's always, um, from us and everybody else, there's always going to be areas where we want a bit more or something a bit different or, or whatever. But I think overall, in what the Chancellor announced yesterday, there was so much to welcome 
um, across all those spheres that you both talked about. So that's really welcome. And I think what you have from us and from, I'm sure everybody on this event is a set of people who really want to work with you and to help and to make it work because ultimately this is about getting young people and adults the jobs and, and skills and futures that they need. So I think we look forward to working in partnership with you and I'm sure everybody else um, on this event does as well. So thank you once again for, for, for all, of, all of your time. This is normally the point at which we end with a round of applause, but it doesn't quite work when we're all on mute on Zoom. But, um, but thank you very much for, for your time. It's much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you all. Okay, so um, uh, thanks to, to Mims and to, to Gillian for, for kicking us off there and giving us um, an overview about what the government's uh, doing and what it announced uh, yesterday as well, um, and trying to dig in a little bit to what that means um, in practice. Um, one of the questions um, I asked about there um, was about the role of um, local um, government. Um, and before, just before, very quickly, before I, I move on to that a bit more, um, I wonder if the learning and work team can just show the results of the poll that we've uh, just been running about whether the government measures were enough. I should probably really have showed this when the ministers were there, um, particularly um, because that's a relatively positive uh, result for them as well. But we'll, we'll let them know how the vote went there. So thank you to the almost 600 people who voted there. So 78% saying it's a good start, but we need uh, to see um, a lot more. Uh, nobody, I think, saying that's enough, we can stop there. Um, but uh, the vast majority saying it's a good start, but, but more to do. Um, so we are going to open up our second poll um, now, so you can get yourself onto Slido. Um, and uh, this, this uh, question is going to be asking about what, who should play the leading role in uh, delivering some of those initiatives and, and trying to get uh, Britain back to work, whether it should be central government or we need more devolution or local government should take the lead. So please do click in and vote uh, on that now. Um, and I'm really pleased that our next speaker um, is Andy Burnham, the mayor of Greater Manchester. We were due to be holding this event in Manchester, but unfortunately events have uh, intervened. Um, so we're very grateful for you uh, joining us um, today, um, Andy, and I'll just pass um, straight across to you and then we'll take questions at the end. Thanks very much, uh, Stephen. Good morning, everybody. Yes, you've reminded me about the, the hit to our events industry uh, in Manchester from uh, this time that we're all living through. But uh, maybe I'll, I'll come back to that uh, uh, later in my um, remarks and just... Um, reflecting on what the ministers said in the, the poll. I mean, I would very much have voted in the way that most people did in the poll. It was a good start. Um, I suppose the little caveat is I, I think much more is needed, and I'm going to come on to explain that, that what that much more uh, is uh, from, from my point of view. Um, so just to um, uh, create some uh, context here uh, in Manchester, uh, we think unemployment may have doubled already, um, and we think that um, already the claims for unemployment-related benefits are up around 90% between March uh, and, um, and, and May. Um, I'm just checking that you can still hear me. You've frozen on my screen, Stephen. Is, is everybody still hearing me okay? Yes, I, I, I can still hear you, yes. Great. Thank, thank you. Sorry sorry to uh, just double-check rather than speaking into the void. <laughs> um, <laughs> So it's a serious situation, uh, given the effect that we've already seen on, on an unemployment. So I want to speak about three things to try and really structure what I want to say to you all today. Uh, number one, uh, about saving jobs. Number two, about creating jobs. And then number three, um, where I think the most needs to be done is about improving jobs. And that's what we're uh, talking about with regards to build back better, make this a moment of positive change for um for the economy and um and particularly for the way people the way people work so on the first theme uh, saving jobs um certainly the announcement yesterday around the furlough incentive uh was positive um because uh, we've got we think 327,000 people furloughed in greater manchester um incentives to keep those people on obviously are welcome um, but here's one area where I think um, the Chancellor perhaps should have gone further yesterday, but, but will need to go further. 
I think he will need to extend furlough uh, for sectors of the economy that just simply can't return in any meaningful way uh, in terms of the timetable that he set out yesterday, you know, January at the latest. I, I'm thinking of those industries that are, um, are, are very well represented in Greater Manchester. I just mentioned one, events, hospitality, of course, live performance, music, uh, theatre, culture. Uh, that's one one whole sort of area uh, where I think more help will be needed. But another is aviation. You know, Manchester is um, Greater Manchester, uh, obviously, uh, is hugely dependent on Manchester Airport. Uh, I think everyone agrees that we're not going to see a return to aviation at anything like the scale, same scale by the end of the year. It will take longer than that. So one appeal um, to the Chancellor and the government from here is more we think will need to be done to continue to follow the logic of the job retention scheme, the furlough scheme, and allow extended access for those industries that are just going to take longer uh, to return. They will be able to recover, but they may just need that bit of extra time uh, to recover and to remove furlough uh, from them in October or January um, will come too soon and therefore jobs will be lost that could otherwise be saved. And we would say follow the logic of the, the scheme that you introduced, Chancellor, which was the right scheme, but just see this through so that we can save those, um, those crucial uh, jobs uh, within the Greater Manchester economy. L let me turn to creating jobs. We had been arguing uh, to the government that we needed uh, a significant intervention for young people, uh, given that their lives have been most damaged uh, by this extraordinary time that we're living through. Uh, plans derailed, um, hope lost. You know, we know the story, don't we? And we know the scarring effect that moments like this can have on young people, set back their careers, their plans, and it take a long time for people to recover. So the Chancellor was absolutely right uh, to make a, a big decision around support uh, for young people. And of course, we are pleased that it is something that we've got some um, experience of the Future Jobs Fund. I think everyone would agree there is a very big similarity between what the Chancellor announced yesterday and what we had uh, in uh, the 2008 to 2010 period, uh, the Future Jobs Fund that came out of the financial uh, crash. So that was, um, was very welcome. Um, also, um, talk of creating more jobs, um, future facing jobs uh, going, going forward. I think we probably would have wanted to see more on that. Uh, and this maybe is something that the spending review really needs to, to nail. Um, if, if we look, if I look at Greater Manchester today, I've set an ambition of 2038 for carbon neutrality in Greater Manchester. And if we are to hit that, we of course need to uh, make progress now on, for instance, retrofitting uh, domestic properties and business properties across the city region. And I'm told uh, it would require a workforce of thousands uh, to do that, uh, to do that properly. Uh, and within the time uh, that we've, uh, the deadline which, which we've uh, set. So, you know, that is a job creation opportunity that is staring us in the face. And we really need to get on with it immediately. And I probably would prefer to hear more uh, yesterday about how resources will be devolved to the city region level to start building those vehicles that will uh, kickstart the, um, the retrofitting activity that we need, uh, we need to see. It will need to be public private, I think, in the early days, it could become a commercial scheme, but you know, we, we would want to see um, more focus there, alongside helping people make the transition to the green economy, because so many industries are going to change as a result of the move towards a zero carbon society. So construction, completely different uh, methods of construction uh, will be needed. And that'll be true in, in motoring as well, the skills that you need uh, to, 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 um, to maintain cars, mechanic skills. I mean, you could go through the whole um, uh, labor market and, and describe how change will be needed. And what there, what there will need to be is quite a big effort uh, around conversion courses for older workers. So people able to kind of switch from a more traditional part of the economy into the growing parts uh, of, of the economy. We have devolved control of the adult education budget in Greater Manchester. We've already taken uh, a number of measures 
to make it more work focused, which it needed to be. I would say to the government, you know, look, expand that adult education budget, focus it on the, um, the, the future facing parts of the economy, um, retrofitting, green construction, digital, and you know, allow us then to start helping people convert their skills into those into those new new areas. So we made a start yesterday on the create job side of this, but I, I think a lot more will be needed. And there is something I think that is going to be needed to, to kind of underpin the whole thing. And that is devolution of skills, training, um, employment support. I think the time has come uh, for that. You know, I was listening very carefully to the ministers and I think both of them understand uh, what, what we as mayors say when we put these points to them. If you're going to follow the government's logic of having more local industrial strategies, it follows that you have to have local skill strategies to support them. You know, we know our economies best. We know what jobs are available within those uh, economies. We know our colleges. We know our businesses that we can rely on. We're in a, a very strong position to deliver the uh, the kickstart scheme that the chancellor announced and we're more likely to make it a success building from the bottom up one criticism i would make of the government's handling of the uh, crisis so far is that it has been way too top down uh, policies dreamt up in downing street uh, not um, uh, not involving or consulting local people on the ground you know big initiatives in launched and then not working when they hit the ground uh, and the government has to learn from that. And I think particularly with the kickstart scheme, there was local involvement in the future jobs fund. And we really need to see uh, the same as this scheme is rolled out and not the sort of, kind of top down uh, approach that we've seen uh, often throughout this crisis uh, so far. But more broadly, I just think we need to see a big commitment to devolution when it comes to education, training, skills and employment support. The, the great strength that we can provide is that we can break down the silos between the two government departments that, that you, you saw on the screen a moment ago, DFE and DWP. The, the, the challenge of supporting people in, into jobs um, involves not just the training side of things, but the personal uh, support that's needed as well, a whole person approach. We've had a measure of um, devolution in Greater Manchester with regard to the government's work programme. Um, it's been focused on those longest out of the labour market and it's been twice as successful as the work programme. Why? Because it doesn't adopt the computer says no tick box approach of the, uh, of the, um, the, you know, the, the film I, Daniel Blake. It comes from the bottom up and it looks person by person at what they need, not just the training needs, but sometimes the mental health support they may need, the coaching. That works, that bottom up approach to helping people become work ready. And we would say to the government, everything you're trying to do will be much more successful if you work with us in that way. Build this from the bottom up um, and you will get the speed in delivery and you will also get the quality. And that's a big appeal that uh, all of the mayors across all the political parties are saying direct to the government. Let me, Stephen, just finish then on improving jobs. I think, you know, when we talk of Build Back Better, jobs are going to change as a result of this, um, uh, this uh, crisis. And, and I hope for the better. Yes, of course, there's going to be a lot of turbulence in the labour market. A lot of support will be needed for people uh, uh, throughout this time. But already you can see how we might kind of rethink the working day, the working week to support people to have a better uh, working uh, life. Uh, so more flexible working for people. Um, that's a reality for, for me at the moment. You know, with 20 percent capacity on public transport, we're going to have to ask businesses in Greater Manchester to stagger um, the start uh, and end time of the working day. So it's not the traditional nine to five day and all of the pressure that that puts on the transport system. So this is through necessity rather than, um, you know, by, by just because we, we desire it. Of course, more homeworking might now be a, a possibility for people having experienced it. It might be more widely available uh, for people to mix um, office and, and, and home, and that might be a good thing. But this challenge of improving jobs, I think, goes far beyond those kind of changes. And I'm going to finish on, on this, this big point, because I, in many ways, think it is the big point from the pandemic, which actually wasn't addressed by the Chancellor yesterday. And I haven't heard the government speak about it. You've got to learn the lessons of the time that we've been living through. One of the big questions we've got to ask is why have the most deprived parts of our country been hardest hit 
by this virus. And I would say one of the reasons for that is the nature of people's work in those uh, deprived uh, places. You have a, um, a concentration of people in low paid, insecure employment. And what I would say is many people in those places are in jobs that do not allow them to follow the government's health advice, the public health, official, the official public health advice. For, for instance, if they become symptomatic and they need to take time off, will they be paid? Well, um, we know some will not. Two million people uh, in this country have no access to statutory uh, sick pay. Um, if many were to get a message from the NHS test and trace system, would they be able to follow that, just to take time off uh, to self-isolate? I honestly don't think so. And we saw a, a glimpse of this in the reports of what came out of the investigations into what happened in Leicester at the weekend, where people in the garments industry being paid less than the minimum wage, clearly staying at work throughout this uh, and, and the consequences uh, we, we see. So I, I would say what's missing at the moment is the government acknowledging there needs to be a much more determined drive to improve the quality of work for everybody, because that is about building resilience in people, in our communities and in the country as a whole. Um, that another pandemic could come any time. Just because we're living through one now, it doesn't mean another one couldn't happen in a, in a couple of years. And we need to be stronger next time. This virus has attacked weaknesses in our defences. And one of those weaknesses is the poor quality of work at the lower levels of the labour market. In Greater Manchester, we have a response to this called the Greater Manchester Good Employment Charter that is about a real living wage, is about... Um, reducing the casualization of work, but is about flexibility and the gender pay gap. And what we will want to do coming out of this is link that good employment charter to all public procurement so that we, we, we raise the standards of work for everybody and consequently give the country uh, more resilience and actually probably give individual businesses more resilience. I you know, hear some businesses all immediately say, oh, we can't afford that now because of the situation that we're, we're in. I would say back, in fact, we need to do it now because we need businesses are going to need to have individual resilience when it comes to their uh, to their workforce. And in fact, there is a business case, a good, strong, solid business case for good employment, because if businesses pay people enough so that they can they have enough to live on and don't make them live hand to mouth, i.e. on a longer term contract rather than a zero hours contract then they will find that retention levels improve, recruitment costs reduce, productivity uh, increases, morale uh, rises. And I think we need to take a, a longer term approach to these issues around the workforce uh, than perhaps um, the, the British economy has, has often done. We've too often followed a race to the bottom, a short term approach. And I think we need to learn from countries where they, they take time to build the resilience of the workforce and so far for me that is a missing piece in the government's response you know it's very clear to me that poor work combined with overcrowded housing has, has hit uh, the poorest communities at hardest and you know there's no point living through a time like this and, and sort of turning our eyes away from some of the real things that have happened here and what we now need to do to build more resilience uh, in our people in our communities in our businesses in our country that is the right and proper thing to do. And I, you know, I, I will continue to argue for that as we, um, as we build back uh, from this, this crisis that we've been living through. So thank you very much for listening, Stephen, and back to you. Great, thank you. Thank you, Andy. And there's um, so much to, to talk about there. And I think, um, so our analysis suggested there's about 11 million key workers, I think, across the uh, economy, which is about one in three jobs. And I think we've all discovered through this crisis just quite how many key workers there are, but they, they tend to be the, the lowest paid, as you were saying, and um, on um, various sort of insecure forms of employment as well. So I think that's a, a really important part of building that better. Um, I, I wanted to go back to the start of, of what you said and ask about those um, furloughed workers and those shutdown sectors. Um, and a report we did at the start of the crisis um, suggested that Greater Manchester had the highest proportion of workers in those shutdown sectors. Um, and the government seems to have taken a view that um, it needs to try and boost demand for hospitality, for example, through the voucher scheme it's done and cuts in VAT and things like that. I guess part of my concern is 
there's limits on capacity in those businesses because of social distancing, no matter what you do. So I, I guess, what, what are you hearing? In, you, you argued for a sort of extension of the furlough scheme. Are you hearing from businesses that you're working with that they would be able to keep people on with that, but the, the voucher scheme and things like that are just not going to be enough to get enough people through the doors? Or what, what's the best response for those sectors? Good question, Stephen. I think people are digesting, aren't they, what was announced yesterday? And there's no, no, no question that all of it will help um, the industry and it should be welcomed. And I, and I do welcome it. But like the poll suggested, does it, does it solve everything? I don't think it, it does. And the slight risk, of course, is that a moment has passed here and we're now heading into the autumn, which is the really worrying time where that cliff edge is sort of looming uh, for people. And do they have enough here to, to, to kind of make it work? And I, and I guess some will, but some won't is, is the way I would uh, describe it. And, and I think, you know, offering a limited access to furlough for the, the businesses who just cannot bring those, those people back. I mean, hospitality, bars, restaurants, they, they've got a chance to start going again, haven't they? But events, as we were saying at the very start, you know, what are they going to, to do? Um, live performance in any in any way really you know what what are they going to do i mean football you know football's huge to us but if the crowds aren't coming aren't allowed to come back think of all the businesses that 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 affects so i think we've seen some positive moves but i think it'd be wishful thinking on the government's part if they think that those things kind of deal with this problem i think aviation is you mentioned the gm economy being very very hit and i think it is because of events sport music um uh, and then Manchester Airport and all of the knock-on industries around it. Um, again, I mean, you know, a strong airport is is critical to a strong north of England, you know, building that international presence. So if you damage the airport's ability to come back by, you know, lots of people leaving, becoming made redundant, then you are really damage, damaging economic recovery in the long run. So I, I just think there needed to be more recognition that furlough needs to become a sort of sector specific proposal um, and not a blanket offer anymore. And it needs, to, you know, simple principle for businesses that can't return to normal operations, they can continue to access furlough. And that would include anything that's a, you know, a live event uh, and of course, uh, aviation. And there are others too, probably. Great, thank you. Yeah, I wasn't going to mention um, sports because um, we're, we both happen to be um, Everton fans, which is kind of uh, so going to be a game on the telly tonight with no no crowds. There is tricky, you, tricky that when you're the mayor of Greater Manchester I with know. those football <laughs> allegiances. But I manage it. I, I usually have to add the words "long suffering" in there somewhere as well. But uh, sure. anyway, that, that, that's a different event. Um, so uh, there's a number of questions that have come through about. Um, um, something you kind of said through a lot of what you were talking about there, which is about the, the role of local government in joining things up. Um, and, you know, I'm very proud to be a member of the Greater Manchester Employment and Skills Advisory Panel that's trying to, to do a bit of, of that as well. And you talked about um, not all of those furloughed workers are going to go back to their jobs no matter what we do, but we are trying to create jobs through retrofitting and, and stuff like that. What, what do you? How, how can you see, uh, or what, what more does local government need, or what role can it play in trying to join that that job creation with those who who've lost their jobs? I would say full devolution of post sixteen um, training and skills policy, um, and you know I, I'm going to have a meeting with Gillian later, Gillian Keegan. I get on get on well with her and have with her predecessors, but. This is more a comment on uh, the civil service rather than the, um, the, the politicians. The Department for Education is the most resistant government department to, to devolution. And um, I can't see the justification for that intransigence because skills policy is something this country has never, ever, ever done well. I think it's a product of two things. One, it's like snobbery in, in English education, which is that we always prioritize the academic route over the uh, vocational route always has happened under all governments but then so that's one problem and so it's always the sort of always the poor relation but then the second problem is that side of education is critically linked to what happens in real places on the ground it's got to be place-based because if you're going to just prioritize things nationally it's not going to work for everyone everywhere and you know if they've done a brilliant job of uh, of, of um, 
technical education, let's call it, over the years, they'd have a they'd have a, a case to be intransigent and say, well, you don't need to, we don't need to devolve, but they haven't, and so something different is needed, and I think devolution allows you, as I say, to break down the two silos of DWP and DFE, because both are needed if you're going to be serious about getting people into, into work. You need to combine the training with the personal uh, support. And, and that's why the panel that you, know, you sit on, and thank you for doing that, is so important, because it's taking that whole person, place-based look at this, uh, at this stuff. So I would say skills is and training is classically something that's got to be built from the bottom up and it's got to link to the real opportunities in the world uh, around around us I, i've tried to put in place even without the powers mechanisms to, to, to sort of take this agenda forward so before the lockdown we, we, we launched something called gmax greater manchester apprenticeships and career service and in my my mind this is our version of ucas so you've got ucas laying out the university route for everybody GMAX is the local um, work-related route uh, so that young people can have visibility, clarity in terms of what they can see in terms of op opportunities in the economy. And then you link those young, the, the side of training that's often the hardest to understand, uh, vocational, is, is becomes much clearer, the landscape becomes much clearer uh, to them. And there is just no way you can do something like that from, from a, national, a national level. And that's why you get so many hit and miss skills policies from a national level that never land on the ground. I, I would just plead with the government, this is the moment to devolve training and skills policy. And Stephen, if you ask Andy Street, if you, um, if you ask Tim Bowles in, in Bristol um, or, or James Palmer in Cambridge, the other Metro mayors, they all say exactly the same thing as myself, Dan Jarvis, Steve Rotherham, and Jamie Driscoll look to the Labour mayors, say the same thing as the Tory mayors, and it's the machine of government that isn't listening, not, not political parties. And I think the moment for this change is absolutely now. Thank you. Yeah, I, I often say about um, skills policy that the, the good thing is that if you don't like this policy, there'll be another one along soon. And that's also the bad thing because we chop and change it um, all the time as well. Um, before I just ask you one, one last question, I wonder if we can put up the results of the, the poll just to see um, how the, the, those votes have uh, come in. Um, there we go. Oh, I really thought I was going to be 52-48 there. Um, so <laughs> yes, <laughs> the, the magic ratio. Um, so yeah, so um, a majority there saying we need some further devolution so that um, local government can, can do its job and work with um, central government as well. And then some people, but a minority saying it, it should be much more down to, to central government. So I think nine in 10 people there saying it's local government either taking the lead or more, they need more um, uh, devolution yeah. um, to do so. Well, that's that's encouraging, obviously, for, for, from my point of view. It's, and I'm not arguing for a kind of, you know, government get out of the way. It's got to be a partnership, hasn't it? You know, mm. Government should set out what it is they want. So they, they set out the vision and then we do the how. We make it work on, on, on the ground. It's got to be a, a partnership, but it's got to allow sort of a, a plurality of approaches and you know, a, a different way of, of doing things in, in, in different places. Mm. So, uh, yeah, I think the poll, I mean, obviously, I would probably tend more to the second uh, the, the, the majority, the minority position on uh, devolution. Um, I think you've got to. People just have to see it as the. You know what we're building in Greater Manchester is a person-centred, place-based approach that isn't just about the silo of uh, education and work and pensions. It's about health. You know, the, the benefit of devolution is you can kind of see the, the kind of totality of public policy as it supports people into work and housing and. I, 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 you know, having left Westminster, I'm the biggest uh, convert for uh, kind of smashing down these white hole silos and making them work in the interests of places rather than the interests of the individual government department. Well, well let, let me just ask you one final um, question on that then, actually, and in terms of tailoring to, to local need. One of the things our research has shown is that the increases in unemployment so far have been highest in those areas where they were highest to begin with. Um, and I think that's true within um, Greater Manchester as well as across the country. 
So I just wonder kind of what your thoughts are on what more we need to do or what tools you need, what investment we need to try and make sure we're, we're sort of, we are doing that levelling up rather than splitting apart and not leaving areas further behind than they were to start with. Well, I think it's what I was saying finally, uh, Stephen, you know, levelling up has to start with people. Because, again, we've seen the poorest areas not levelled up but laid low by uh, this virus. And the question is why? And as I said, I don't think it's that complicated. If you are in a job where you don't have enough to pay all the bills and make it work, and it's a sort of hand-to-mouth existence, you know, you don't have the resilience, do you, then, to, um, you can't level up on foundations like, uh, like that. And, you know, you could promise any number of shovel-ready projects to those communities, and you still won't uh, level them up because you are not addressing kind of fundamental weakness of the labour market in those places. You know, these are places like the one I used to represent, Lee, that go back to the 60s, 70s, had some of the most stable labour markets, you know, through the old industries, mining, etc. And they've become low-wage, um, insecure, and you cannot level those places up until you recognise that. And let's, let's get to it. Let's address this contradiction. That we've all been sort of um, kind of you just you've just touched on it, you know. People on conferences like this, so let's say more middle class people who can have Zoom conferences through this and stay at home very comfortably, have been applauding, as you said, essential workers. But actually, their their pay and terms and conditions don't reflect the fact that they're essential, because if you're going to pay somebody less than the living wage on an insecure contract, you're not creating the conditions where they can be in work every day without fail. You, you, you're you're not paying them as essential. You're paying them as um, kind of, uh, you know, to spend, you know, as though you don't need them. If, 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 if you know, they're, they're kind of, they're nice to have, but not, not essential. And it's not, it's not right, is it? So take something like social care. How, how can it possibly be right that social care also has a, a, a labour market that works on that, on that basis? You know, where, you know, we've seen, Unison did a survey, 80% of people in social care at the start of lockdown working in social care, said they feared they wouldn't be paid if they needed to self-isolate. Now, again, there is one of the big lessons of what we've been living through. You know, it tells you something about why we've seen what we've seen in, in care homes. So I just think if you're going to level up, level up has got to start meaning a bit more rather than sort of fairly glib promises of projects and hard hats and building sites. You've got to level up by starting with people and communities, building more resilience in those uh, in those places, improving work for people, you know, and, you know, I, I, I think personally that um, the countries that have been hit hardest by uh, COVID, if you look around the world, probably the, are the least equal when it comes to treatment in the workplace and the virus has attacked those, those, those weaknesses. Great. Thank you. And I think um, it's a really important point. If, if, if people are key workers, then we should at the very least pay them enough to live on. Um, both, you know, in general, and then also specifically through. Um... I think we need to say it as it is. And, and mm -hmm. what I would say is, for probably the last twenty years, we've been overpaying people in the top half of organisations, public and private, and we've been underpaying people in the bottom half. And uh, that, I'm afraid, is a policy that, in the end, takes you to a situation like the one I've just described. And I think you get better, healthier organisations if the gap between the person at the bottom uh, is not so, you know, is, is narrower than it currently is because morale improves, team spirit improves, common endeavour improves. Um, that's how you pay. And people will say, well, how do you pay for all of these changes at the, at the bottom? That's how, you, that's how you pay for it. And, you know, I, I certainly would advocate that in, in my own situation, my own uh, city, you know, too many people are not being supported. Their work is not giving them good health. And, you know, anyone involved in this debate needs to start saying work needs to create health in communities. Until it does, we've got a problem. Yeah. Well, I know, I know this is a topic we're going to get onto during the, the rest of our panel sessions as well, but I need to um, unfortunately draw us to, to a close there. Um, I'm very grateful for your time this morning because I, no I know how much you've got going on. Um, and we will definitely try be, to be back to, to help the uh, local events industry as soon as we <laughs> have to you. as well. Oh, <laughs> I feel guilty I look forward to welcoming you. 
<laughs> okay. um, so, so Andy, thank you very much for your time. It's much appreciated. Thank no you. No worries. Thanks, Stephen. Thanks, everybody. Thank you for listening. Um, so I'm now going to pass across to our Director of um, Policy and Research, Fiona Aldridge, who's going to chair the rest of this morning. So Fiona, over to you. Thank you, Stephen. Um, well, welcome, everybody. Um, we, as you'll agree, we've had lots of food for thought um, to stimulate our discussion and our questions for the second half of the event, where this will be uh, much more interactive, um, opportunities for questions, and I see that we've already had some already. Um, so this is going to be a panel discussion where we're going to explore the impact of the crisis and discuss how we can get Britain back to work. And we've got a leading panel of employment and skills experts. Um, I'm going to introduce them and then ask each of them just to speak for three minutes and then we will open up to questions so please do let us have questions on the chat. So I'd like to introduce first of all Laura Gardner who's Research Director at Resolution Foundation, um, Kate Bell Head of Rights International Social and Economics at the TUC, Councillor Abby Brown who's the leader of Stoke-on-Trent City Council and lead member of the LGA City Regions Board, and David Hughes, who's Chief Executive of the Association of Colleges. So if we get straight into the panel session, Laura, could I ask you to start, please? Uh, absolutely. Uh, thank you very much for having me. Um, so uh, I've been asked to set out very briefly um, the Resolution Foundation's recent research and thinking on uh, the impact of coronavirus on the labour market and how policy should respond. Um, that's a really big question and it's something um, we've done quite a bit of work on. We published a, a long report on this uh, last Monday. Um, so I thought I'd just highlight a couple of key points on that and then from that and then reflect on where we are uh, policy wise. So um, our report, our, our work has highlighted who's been hit um, by the shock uh, that this crisis is having in the labour market. Um, I think, uh, we, so we've highlighted younger workers, um, lower paid workers and those in atypical work. What a lot of that stems from, the vast majority of that, is the fact that this is an incredibly sector specific crisis. So uh, far more so than previous crises, the, the effects on some sectors to date, especially hospitality, non-food retail and um, leisure have been far bigger than in other sectors. And we think that will continue. And that's what drives a lot of the pattern of effects we've seen by age, pay and so forth. Uh, the other thing it drives is um, a less geographically concentrated crisis than we might have experienced in the past. So because those sectors we're talking about, uh, hospitality, non-food, retail and leisure are everywhere in the country, this is a very evenly spread, spread crisis, which is in some ways a good thing, but can make the policy response a bit harder. Um, if we had if we had the 80s again and that then um, and, and an incredibly concentrated crisis in parts of the north of England, for example, uh, that that would be really bad. But a policy response of building kind of a big plant in one place uh, would be quite an effective means of solving that. And so the geographical dispersion of this crisis presents a different set of policy challenges. Um, that said, obviously, some areas, particularly those reliant on tourism, uh, are, will have tough, tougher times than others. So it's obviously not completely even. Um, in our report, we set out uh, reasons uh, not to be complacent about the speed of bounce back. Yes, we will get a quick bounce back initially as the economy reopens, but social distancing is still a thing in and that has big impacts on some sectors in particular. Again, um, that those those supply constraints will remain and that will limit productivity in those sectors. And compared to the previous crisis, we can't rely on um, the depreciation of sterling delivering real wage falls. Um, and firms entered this crisis with weaker profits and weaker cash flows than they did the previous one. And those have been deteriorating since 2016. Uh, so we don't think bounce back will be complete and swift enough. And we are also nervous about just relying on reallocation of workers uh, from the suffering sectors to other sectors of the economy. We should, we should want that, that will happen and we should encourage it. But because this is a fundamentally temporary shock and because the types of people we're talking about losing their jobs, lower skilled workers with generally shorter commutes and quite low qualifications, quite spread around, out around the country, make us nervous about the speed with which uh, the, the, these workers can reallocate. So the type of solution we've advocated does two things. We've said you need to resist against uh, the outflows of workers from those hardest hit sectors. 
So I think aspects of what the Chancellor said yesterday in terms of the VAT cut and um, eat out to help out, which is a bizarrely named policy, but um, the intentions around that in terms of stimulating demand in those sectors and reducing costs were right. I think we, I, I think we think they probably weren't big enough and bricks and mortar retail was notably absent from um, the, the response. So I think more probably will be needed in those sectors. And we advocated, for example, a wage subsidy turning the job retention scheme into a job protection scheme. Um, I don't think the job retention bonus uh, quantitatively is anywhere near enough to, to help out in those sectors. Uh, and the second big thing we allocated and then advocated and then I'll stop talking is um, speeding that reallocation to other sectors. I think in that respect, the kickstart program and aspects of the traineeship and apprenticeship response and the housing retrofitting uh, spending were really welcome in this week's announcements. Uh, I was disappointed not to hear anything on social care. I think if you're looking at sectors that can create lots of jobs that don't have high qualification requirements and that are spread out across the country, uh, the retrofitting stuff is good and it meets longer term policy goals, but we are we badly need a functioning social care system in this pandemic. It's a jobs rich sector. It's needed investment for a while. So I think job creation there could have done a bit more. So I think overall so far, the response has probably been a bit stronger on the reallocation side and some of the activation policies have been good. I think we will need more in terms of reducing wage costs and helping people function in the hardest hit sectors in the months ahead. And I'd expect to hear more about them, including um, retail in particular uh, in the in the autumn budget. Thank you. Uh, Kate, can I come to you? The TUC has published its plans for jobs. Would you like to give us just a three minute intro? You're on mute, Kate. It wouldn't be uh, an event in 2020 if somebody didn't say that. Glad to fulfil that role. Um, Thanks very much for having me. Um, very briefly, lots of overlap with what Laura said. So um, we published a plan for jobs. It's obviously a popular and pretty obvious title um, for announcements around now. And we had a four point plan, which I'll just briefly talk through how we thought the Chancellor's statement yesterday measured up. Um, so we talked about recognising some of the challenges Laura set out. We talked about the need for large scale job creation. Um, we talked about the 200,000 vacancies in the NHS and social care and how those could be filled with better investment. We talked about the 100,000 redundancies we've had in local government over the last decade. Um, and we talked about an 85 billion pound infrastructure spending boost to create over a million jobs in new green industries. Um, and we got kind of about 7 billion of new infrastructure investment. So not really enough there. And I think one of our kind of reflections on this is the Chancellor's plan at the moment seems to be put things back to where they were. You know, we have a consumption driven economy. Let's carry on having a consumption driven economy and hope that some people go back. Whereas actually some of the government's rhetoric has set out that they want to level up, that they want a higher productivity, higher skill economy. And we weren't really seeing the statement yesterday driven by any sense of kind of an industrial strategy. There is a massive need to create jobs. And with a bit of design, we could be creating those in the sectors we need. Um, secondly, we called for a sectoral support plan. Um, we wanted to see, as Laura said, more support for retail, more support for manufacturing, more support for aviation. We wanted to see those packages designed um, by bringing unions and businesses together and thinking about how we might use the job retention scheme, um, either how Laura set it out, or we thought for businesses which have a viable chance of survival, but to face longer to, um, you know, will need a longer time to recover, some form of extension for those businesses will be important. And importantly, it doesn't quite fit the this point, but I want to say it, a sort of extension of the job retention scheme for people who are shielding or who have caring responsibilities and can't return to work when their colleagues do. Um, thirdly, and more positively, um, we started calling for a job guarantee scheme in May, so I'm pretty pleased to see the announcement of the Kickstart scheme. Um, some things that need to happen to make that work, um, they need to be good quality jobs with training built in, um, they need to be additional jobs, and we think they need to be designed by regional recovery panels who actually have the local knowledge about skills infrastructure, about what the local area needs, about local industrial strategies and can also bring together unions and businesses who can kind of quality assure those job placements and make sure um, you know they're actually delivering real opportunities. Lastly we said that the Chancellor needed a plan to kind of build inequality throughout his set of 
set of interventions. We know that black workers and disabled workers often face a situation where they're first out when it comes to job losses and last in when it comes to rehiring. And that's what we've seen in previous recessions. Um, we had the chance to talk a bit yesterday about how the hospital hospitality industry disproportionately employs black and minority ethnic workers, but no real sense that there was a kind of targeted approach to saying, how do we build in equality from the start? Um, just the last thing I wanted to say was, we think this plan for jobs is absolutely vital, but it has to be backed up by a decent social security system. Levels of um, universal credit are still inadequate. We've got that five week wait still pushing people into debt and hardship. And of course, we've got our inadequate levels of sick pay, which again, are putting people in really difficult situations. We thought that was an opportunity yesterday to address some of those challenges and disappointed the Chancellor didn't take it. Thank you, Kate. Abby, can we come to you next? What does this look like for Stoke-on-Trent? Okay, um, thank you. And thank you for inviting me to um, come along today um, and represent the LGA. And I'd like to give a bit of an overview of what, you think, of what we believe that um, is needed to get Britain back to work. Um, I think it's good news that the government is coming forward with a jobs and skills recovery plan, including the Kickstart scheme that we've heard so much about, um, more investment in sector-based academies, more employment support, including a new programme for the long-term unemployed and a green homes grant that will require thousands of new green jobs to be created. And for me, um, as, a, as a local leader in Stoke-on-Trent, it's vital that these fit the needs of my residents and local businesses in Stoke-on-Trent and link to our local opportunities. So today, I have a fantastic offer for the Chancellor, Rishi Sunak, to get his policies really going. Because local government, and we are the experts in knowing what's happening at the grassroots level, want to co-design recovery with the government. Um, recent LGA data has suggested that resident satisfaction with their local councillors is at a record level. And we think we are therefore best placed to show residents how the Chancellor's policies can help them land and most importantly, keep those jobs. And of course, during lockdown, local government have got on and we've delivered support for local businesses to the unemployed um, and supported local training providers. In Stoke-on-Trent, our JETS team, the Jobs Employment and Training Service, provide an integrated employment service, bringing together all age careers advice, job support, apprenticeships, adult learning and sector skills support. It has a lead role in the countywide redundancy task group, offering employment support to those who've been made redundant um, and a jobs brokerage service to help local businesses recruit. Since March in Stoke-on-Trent, we've helped over 200 people with over 50% having applied for jobs and 25% of those having already found work. Now, I think that my JETS team are the absolute bee's knees, but I can reassure the Chancellor today that there's hundreds of equally great services at local authorities up and down the country who are absolutely itching to get stuck in and help out. The pooled expertise of local government across the country believes that a co-designed, locally delivered employment and skills offer is needed. And as experts in this sector, we'd recommend to the government um, a locally pooled public enterprise levy to help us to plan, target sectors to support the local economy, widen participation and to deliver the opportunity guarantee. We'd also suggest investment in local job support programmes, and we're delighted that the Chancellor announced the billion pound employment support investment into Job Centre Plus, work and health programmes, and a new programme for the long-term unemployed. And we graciously suggest that this last one is best delivered by us in local government. And for people in places where back to work support is insufficient, we'd suggest accelerating a co-designed job stimulus, reflecting the economic challenges and opportunities of different places. A job guarantee could be designed to help us build on lessons from the past. And uh, once again, really pleased that the Chancellor has recognised our expertise and announced the Kickstart programme for 16 to 24 year olds. Investment, of course, in green jobs should be accelerated to counter huge job losses. Um, research for the LGA published in the last few weeks shows that over 700,000 jobs could be created in England by 2030, rising to a million by 2050 with an emphasis on this sector. We also believe that we really need to gear increased skills investment to train people to newly created local jobs, including green jobs and existing vacancies underpinned by local careers advice and guidance systems. This would give much needed tailored support in particular to young people and older workers. So now I know, Rushi, you're out there watching me, we'll be asking just what do you need to do to take advantage of our combined expertise and enable local government to lead jobs and skills recovery efforts? So can I suggest, First of all, a national COBRA 
for jobs and skills to maintain political focus, urgency of action, dialogue and co-designed recovery. Secondly, local government led local jobs and skills task force, bringing together government and agencies, employers, further in higher education, providers, the third sector and unions to pool expertise and coordinate resources, building on rapid response models. And thirdly, a multi-year local jobs and skills funding pot enabling genuine flexibility to meet differing needs of local of each locality. Local labour market plans would set out cross funding coming into the area, outcomes and delivery plans to mobilise partners and to ensure local and national public accountability for funding and outcomes. So coming out of this, the government should back and fund the trialling of the LGA's work local model for an integrated and evolved employment and skills system. As an example, for a medium sized combined authority, this could lead to an additional eight and a half thousand people leaving benefits and an additional um, 5,700 people increasing their qualifications. We all know that the government love a good slogan. So here's one today for you, Chancellor, trust local for work local. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and David, over to you. The ASC has been calling for a skills-led recovery plan. Is this what we have? Um, we've got a jobs-led recovery plan, Fiona, I think. So um, thanks for the opportunity. I mean, it's a, it's a shame, isn't it? I think we had an opportunity to make it a jobs and skills-led recovery plan. And I think there's an element of that. I think we've just missed that target a little bit. And it feels to me that we're still living in a a world where it's either jobs or skills and it's not both. I mean, there's an apprenticeship incentive, of course there is, but the state of the labour market makes some of us a bit sceptical about how successful that might be. You know, it, it will incentivise some new apprenticeships and some employers to take on young people and adults, but we're, we're, we're worried that it won't be enough. It depends on the, the sort of pace of recovery um, and whether it's V-shaped or L-shaped or whatever shape it might be. So it's, I think, you know, and it's very, it feels a bit churlish, doesn't it, to say, um, he's not done enough when he's uh, just committed £30 billion um, and he's, he's committed several hundreds of millions to colleges, you know, which is fantastic news. So there's some really good stuff in here. But I think there are probably three really important areas that I'd focus on. And um, the first it comes back to what Abby was just saying. It, I think that we really must get place based planning partnership right. You know, that if we're going to get the right response to the labour market and, and Andy Burnham was talking about this earlier, we have to get... Job Centre Plus, local authorities, colleges, training providers, voluntary community sector unions working together. And, and I think that focus is going to be really important over the coming weeks and months, because what the chance has done, and it's really sensible, I think, is try to build on the pro programmes and the structures that we've already got. So no new fancy programmes, you know, no sort of, you know, future jobs fund, which took a long time to set up because they do take a long time to set up. So what we've got is a, a, an opportunity to kind of cobble together what we've already got in train in probably a fairly dysfunctional skills and jobs um, environment, in my view. You know, so uh, we've got this next year to make the best of what we've got. There's some new investment that's going to be really helpful. But that locality place based partnership, I think, is essential. So that's number one. Second, though, I think we also need some national sector focus as well. So we're doing quite a lot of work in construction where we know that the employers want to work together, uh, the unions want to work with us, the colleges want to work with us. That, you know, what we need is Job Centre Plus, DWP, DFE working with all of those parties to make sure we can navigate ways through. So the kit, the hit to the labour market and to jobs in the next, maybe it's only going to be six to 12 months. It might be longer. It doesn't really matter. But the hit is going to be so profound that we need to navigate ways through for people to get the skills they need for when the job starts kicking. It, jobs are really, really important, but only if people have got the right sets of skills to do them. So that sector focus around construction, around NHS and care, you know, where I think Laura's talking about that care, the care opportunities will be there, you know. So let's let's get bring people together and start trying to form those alliances. And then the third area, which I think is really important, is there's just not enough in this budget, mini budget for 16 and 17 year olds. There was a catch up fund of a billion pound for schools, but it stopped at age 16. No reason for that. There are lots and lots of year 11s who are going to need extra support in September. And then on the adult side, and I know Gillian Keegan talked about apprenticeships for adults as being an opportunity. That's true, but it's still not enough. We think there needs to be more emphasis on intensive training for people to move from, you know, retail into care, for instance. And we mustn't forget, finally, all of those skills problems that we had before the pandemic hit 
that we were thinking would get worse because of Brexit. Remember, Brexit is coming soon. Um, are still there. So the, the higher level skills problems at levels three, four, five in some of the key sectors, engineering, logistics, digital, you know, and health, construction, are not, have not gone away. And we haven't got the skills infrastructure to help people in work to get those skills or help young people get those skills and for the future. So we're going to be hitting in the new year, perhaps in the spring, some horribly hard to fill vacancies just as Brexit's hitting we won't be able to fill them with EU workers. We need the skills response to that. So our focus is also on a kind of November budget and thinking about what's going to be in there and on um, Gavin Williamson's speech, which is probably going to be um, published in a, in a few minutes, about the new skills system that, and his vision for that through the white paper, which I think is actually quite exciting. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, lots of questions coming in, but I just want to pull out a couple for the panel. Um, there's been lots of focus on levels of employment um, and about job creation. How do we ensure that the jobs that we create are good jobs, that we get high quality? Hey, could I bring you in? Yes, sure. Um, well, one really interesting thing I picked out in um, Rishi Sunak's speech yesterday was he did talk about decent work. Um, and I think, you know, in the past, we've had a kind of myth, basically, that there's some kind of um, tension between more and better jobs. All the evidence now tells us that better quality job is jobs are more productive. They lead on higher wages, higher wages leads to more spending, that leads to more jobs. So we've absolutely got to have an ambition to um, drive up the quality of work. I think that requires two things. One is designing into our job creation um, measures to improve conditionality on employ employers about what are the types of those jobs, what are the levels of pay. And we've also suggested that that should apply to government support that they're giving directly to business. So one example, for we said that some of their sector support might come in the form of equity stakes. And that to get um, some of that support, businesses should be setting out a jobs and fair pay plan about how they're going to protect jobs and enhance jobs in the organisation. But we've got to kind of not forget that there was a whole agenda on this beforehand. Government are still planning to bring forward an employment bill, we think, um, at some point in the autumn. That was supposed to have measures to tackle things like zero hours contracts, um, unfair scheduling shifts, um, unfair employment status. And those are some of the issues we've seen massively exposed during this pandemic. If we think of some of the people on the front line, care workers would be the really obvious example. A quarter of them were on zero hours contracts and their insecure work, um, their low levels of pay have been one of the issues that we've seen kind of, you know, contributing to the pretty awful statistics on their mortality rates, contributing to the fact that they don't get sick pay and something we absolutely have to tackle as we come out of crisis. Thank you. And there's also been quite a lot of questions around the focus on young people, which is welcomed, but lots of the contributors to today's event feel that there's quite a gap around adults. What do, we, what, what do you think should be done around um, protecting jobs and creating jobs and skills for adults? Um, Laura? Um, yeah, I think I think that's a good challenge. I think um, it is probably right. I would I would sort of defend um, the the government's focus on, on young people to some extent. I think uh, the evidence around scarring and who who gets the long term employment and pay prospects scarred in um, in recessions and the sort of drift in apprenticeship spending towards older apprentices, often already with the firm gaining higher level qualifications in recent years um, mean that I'm, I'm quite pleased about the focus on young people. I think with something like the, the kickstart scheme in particular, uh, we just have to be really honest about, I, I think David said a version of this, how difficult these things are to get off the ground. Uh, doing something three times the size of the Future Jobs Fund is, is a really big ambition. It's going to be really hard. We can't, job guarantees can't be created kind of indefinitely so it is right to focus those on who the evidence suggests will be hardest hit I think I think the kind of skills and jobs um across across the age range it is going to be some of those um uh, tough questions around how when it comes to uh, home retrofitting social care wherever else the investment spending is going and when it comes to whether we are prepared to do more on job protection, wage subsidies, reducing wage costs in some of these hardest hit sectors through the autumn and uh, winter. I think it's um, it is those measures we should be looking to. So I'd want to see the the green ambitions laid out yesterday kind of backed up with um, 
really high quality training to get people of all ages into those jobs. I'd hope to see, as I've said, something similar on social care coming through. And I think um, a broader support for the hardest hit sectors will benefit people across the age range. Um, it is really tough, but I think it is right to focus on young people with some of the kind of more intensive um, traineeship and job guarantee spending. Uh, it's not, not going to be possible to do it for everyone. Great. And finally, just that um, we have talked about and often the focus can be about getting back. But of course, there were all sorts of challenges within our um, skills system and labour market beforehand with certain groups excluded. Um, and there was a, a and there is a levelling up agenda that we need to address. Any last thoughts about how we ensure that those who were left behind before we went into this crisis have an opportunity to level up now and that we don't just return to how we were? David? Yeah, I mean, I think there's, there's just millions of adults in low paid work, insecure work, in poverty, in work poverty, um, who have just never had in the last decade a, a chance to do any skills training or, or get support from their employer. And I think that's got to be a really big focus over the medium term. I think short term, it's quite difficult. And I'm, and I, I'm kind of with Laura in that I think it was right to focus on young people. I think the, the focus on low skilled and, and low qualified adults, I think it's, it's got to come next, though, because they're the ones who will be kind of next next worst hit by um, this recession. And we know that employers invest very little in staff and what where they do invest, they invest mainly in people at higher levels. And if they're going to get the people they need for the future, you know, NHS is a classic. If we want 50,000 nurses, we actually need a pipeline that started developing three or four years ago to get the 50,000 in the next couple of years, you know. And so we need to, those pipelines to be put in place with employers, with training providers and colleges. And that, that needs a big system shift, I think, and a different investment it needs the government to recognize that you know post brexit the labor market will be really difficult and there won't be lots of people with intermediate and higher level skills and the only way we're going to get them is from the existing workforce and at the moment the system doesn't deliver to that so that could do two things it helps employers but it also could provide real opportunities for people to progress in work which could be really good news and um, for productivity and social mobility Great. Thank you very much. Um, I'm sure there'll be lots more um, questions, but we do have to bring it to a close there. So uh, thank you to the panel uh, for your input and for your questions. Um, can I move on now to our um, second panel, which is um, top of the policies? And this is where we're going to focus on three big ideas which could make a real difference in the wake of the coronavirus crisis. Uh, we've asked, asked each of the participants to pitch in no more than three minutes, uh, setting out their case for change, how it could be delivered and what the benefits would be. And then we have some questions um, for them afterwards. Um, if you are um, using Slido, you will be able to vote there. So um, pop across. Um, to our third poll and our three policy pitches come from uh, Charlotte Pickles, Director of Reform, Alan Lockley, Head of RSA Future Work Centre and Emily Jones, Head of Research at Learning and Work Institute. So um, Charlie, could I hang, hand over to you first, please? Hi, Fiona. I'm really sorry. I can't start my video. Uh, so I can talk to you. Uh, if that's okay, but I, I can't get it to. Okay, perfect. Can you hear me all right? Yes. Okay, perfect. All right, so three minutes. So um, my pitch is for career changes. And I think this is the big uh, missing uh, group from the statement that we heard yesterday. Um, we jointly with Learning and Work uh, published a paper last week. Uh, I recommend everybody reads it. It's called When Furlough uh, Has to Stop. Uh, and career changes were a big focus for us uh, in that. Why is that the case? Because as you've probably heard many times already this morning, uh, there are different unique aspects to this recession. But one of the biggest is the fact that it is really sectoral based. And that means that we're going to have a small but really quite sizable group of people who are not just going to have to switch jobs, which would be tough enough, but they're going to have to start over again in an entirely new sector. So I wanted to pitch three specific recommendations within the package that we put forward that I hope uh, you will all agree are very sensible uh, policies to go with. Firstly, we think that all of those up to 
200,000 um, people who might have to create change should be given a £5,000 individual learning account, uh, which they can access accredited training to make sure that they can reskill for a new sector. Secondly, a lot of those people are going to probably face wage drops. So they're going to be shifting sectors and re-entering at an entry level. Um, we think that both to incentivize career changing, but also to mitigate against the uh, uh, financial impact of having to do so, that we should give up to £3,000 in either a career changer grant, which would be means tested, or a career changer premium uh, in universal credit. This should be time limited, probably for a year, but would enable that kind of financial smoothing for people to do the, the sector shift. And finally, uh, we also think that the government needs to put in place uh, sector-based ambition programmes. And this would be bringing businesses and skills providers together in local areas to develop and then implement uh, programmes to enable that upskilling, but upskilling in the sectors where there's going to be local demand. So it's focused uh, upskilling. And at the end of a career changer completing that program, they would be guaranteed an interview for a job. And these would be similar to, in the US, the work advance programs uh, that have a very good evidence base. So they're my three policies within the, the general kind of we need to do something for it for career change at, uh, a kind of group. And just very, very briefly, why should you pick this group over what I'm sure will be brilliant presentations from everybody else? Uh, because good policies, I think, have to have five elements. One, they have to be quickly deliverable, particularly within a crisis. These things are. Two, they have to be affordable. Now, affordable is a relative concept at the moment, but within the relative concept, these are very affordable initiatives. They should be targeted to minimize wasting any of taxpayers' money. All of these are. They should also go with the grain of what government uh, would want to do, and these do. These fit with the right to re retrain, the focus on upskilling, uh, particularly in left behind communities. And finally, they'll have a positive boost to productivity over the long term. So that's my uh, pitch to you. And I very much hope uh, that you will support it. That's great, Charlie. Thanks very much. Alan, can we come over to you um, to pitch to us the concept of universal basic income? Yes. And I, I, I'm, just before I start, I'd like to I know this is a competition, but I would also you know, strongly endorse Charlotte's. Uh, some solid ideas, particularly the idea of individual learning accounts, which we, we really think could be transformative but I've been the pandemic going on. Um, yeah, universal basic income, right. So, first of all, our ask is not of the government to introduce universal basic income tomorrow in the middle of a pandemic. Our ask is a bit more uh, nuanced than that, and we think that it, there is a tremendous opportunity to build uh, a pilot in some of the most affected communities by the pandemic, so communities where the is uh, where basically all of the economic value comes from tourism and hospitality. There's a degree of realism that needs to be brought into those sectors as to what they can achieve in a socially distant economy that I don't think the government is there yet. And so there's an opportunity to trial it and build to a trial as we move beyond furlough. Right, so universal basic income, uh, many of you will be familiar with, but it's a universal and unconditional cash payment for all. It is at least in the RSA's models meant also to be basic. We've done a lot of work with the Scottish government who are committed to a trial of universal basic income and our most generous model for them is a £5,000 uh, uh, a year, uh, paid weekly of course, um, universal basic income which we do not think would replace work incentives uh, and would not also completely replace the existing welfare system. Now I won't go into that model in, in, in any depth other than to say that it can be paid for and we've set out ways how it can be paid for, um, you know, a range of measures there many of which are progressive and redistributive. Um, but it is also phenomenally expensive. I'm not going to duck uh, that, that issue. Uh, and so I'm now going to set out why I think it is also phenomenally transformative in the long term. Uh, there are five arguments, really, and they all uh, overlap with each other. First, uh, I think it speaks, U UBI speaks directly to how the labour market and also the welfare state generate uh, modern economic insecurity, which is much more in work so we've seen problems with the way uh, universal credit works and the work allowances work there, but also it, it is volatile. There's income volatility is growing and universal uh, basic income responds directly to that challenge. Uh, the reason it does that is its unconditionality. Uh, and we are, you know, 
vehemently opposed to the aggressive sanctioning regime that we've seen as part of the UC system. Uh, and really, I think it's important for the state to stop making complicated value judgments on, on people's behavior when they're looking for work. That will be more important, and this is why we think universal, the third argument is a resilient system, when we move into technological transformation. In some senses, on a scale obviously previously unimaginable, the pandemic with a rapid demand shock models what technology will do to the labor market in particular sectors. You will see immediate demand shocks uh, where people are going to have to transition between different sectors. And so you, it is a natural component, we feel. It is a resilient system, but there's also a natural component to some of the active labor market policies that Charlotte was was was, was pushing. Uh, it's also incredibly empowering. You know, Martin Sanbu, the Financial Times journalist, uh, puts it, who's an enthusiast, describes it as the ability to say no to bad work terms and conditions. We think that's really, really important and will change employers' behavior at the bottom end of the labor market, but will also incentivize good work practices and change the power and balance for people who are at that part of the labor market. And finally, a broad political point, we believe it, it will generate solidarity and it's a, a, a version of universal fairness. Now, it is expensive and would rely on progressive taxation, but all of the great expansions of the welfare state, most obviously the NHS, are based on a kind of universal solidarity fairness. Nobody says, which they say about UBI, nobody says about the, the NHS that it is regret, its model of taxation is regressive, but then poor people pay a greater share of their income for the NHS than richer people. We believe, but it still has that kind of universal, we are a country, this is part of your entitlement to the citizen of Britain, fairness. We believe that expanding the welfare state politically must proceed in that basis, and that's one reason why we think UBI is well suited to a more generous welfare state. Great, thank you. Um, and Emily, just before I come to you, I'd just like to remind everybody um, to vote on Slido um, for the options as they come up and we'll be showing you the results uh, shortly after this. Uh, so if you haven't voted, uh, please do as um, Emily speaks and you'll have heard from all three. Emily, can I hand over to you, please? Great, thank you. So I'm making the case for apprenticeship funding to be refocused on young people. The number of apprenticeships has plummeted as a result of the coronavirus pandemic and young people have been hit the hardest and this increases the risk of rising youth unemployment. The number of young apprentices was already low before the pandemic so 16 to 18 year olds made up just a quarter of apprenticeship starts last year and in part this is due to the introduction of the levy with many large employers investing in existing employees and older workers limiting opportunities for young people. So urgent action is needed to boost apprenticeships for young people, and this is especially important now, given the wider context and economic impact of the pandemic, where there's a real risk of a spike in youth unemployment, and we know that long term, this can have a scarring effect on young people's prospects. So how do we solve this? Well, we must remember, first of all, that apprenticeships are jobs, so any solution to boosting apprenticeships needs to include incentives for employers. I'm therefore proposing that apprenticeship funding is refocused in three ways. Firstly, that apprenticeships um, for young people aged 16 to 18 should be fully funded by the government through the education budget. This would ensure consistency with other education routes and employers would be able to hire young apprentices without using their levy funds. Secondly, I would give employers more flexibility with how they spend the levy. At the moment, apprenticeship levy funds can only be used to cover the cost of training and assessing apprentices not to cover wages. So I'm arguing that employers should be able to use their levy funds to pay for up to half the wage costs of apprentices aged 16 to 24. And then thirdly, we know that SMEs are more likely to hire young people, so they should receive a grant for every apprentice they hire aged 16 to 24. These changes would help to avoid high levels of youth unemployment and ensure that young people get the training they need to kickstart their careers. Giving employers access to more funding for young apprentices will help them to overcome the barriers that they experience in hiring young people, such as investment of time for additional supervision. And refocusing the levy in this way would help to ensure better value for money within the system because funding would be steered towards career starters rather than replacing training that employers might have paid for anyway. Getting Britain back to work requires urgent action 
Um, and we need to make sure this gives young people a way into work. We already have an apprenticeships programme, and so there are some quick wins to be made just by changing the rules and giving employers more flexibility about how they spend their money. Thank you, Emily. Uh, thank you to all three of you. Hopefully everybody has had a chance to vote now. Um, could we see the results, please? Fabulous. Thank you. So, uh, so quite, quite close. Um, and uh, uh, a winner for uh, Charlotte for her support for furloughed workers, uh, but following closely, oh, it's changing as a go, uh, following closely behind Alan's suggestion on universal basic income and then refocusing apprenticeship funding. Actually, uh, thankfully, we don't just have to pick one policy idea in life, but we can um, often put them together in order to ensure that um, different groups' needs are met. Um, and so uh, thank you for each of thank you to all of you uh, for your contribution. Um, and at this point, I'd like to hand over to Stephen. Great, thank you, Fiona. Um, and uh, a, a big thanks um, to um, all of our speakers today, including on that uh, last session. I think um, hopefully you'd agree it's been a really stellar um, lineup throughout the morning, and we haven't half packed a, a lot into to two hours. Um, <clears throat> so a big thank you to all of our speakers. <clears throat> thank you also to all of our sponsors, um, to Stay Nimble, uh, the Digital College, Clarion Futures, the Palladium Group and Cognisoft, whose support helps to make things like this um, happen. So we're very grateful um, for it. And thank you also to everybody else who's uh, been a participant and dialed in and asked a question and voted on the various um, polls that we've had. Um, this is the first um, one of these sorts of events that we've done at this sort of scale online. So thank you for bearing with us. I think the technology uh, broadly worked. So hopefully it worked um, from everybody's um, perspective and apologies if there were any um, glitches along the way. Um, I guess the last thing I just wanted to say is that um, we've talked a lot about a lot of different policies during the last couple of hours or so. Um, and I think a lot of what the government announced yesterday was welcome um, and along the sort of lines that we and others have been arguing for. Um, but clearly what we've identified through the discussions and the questions as well are some gaps and some areas where we need to do more. And I think in particular um, that idea of adult upskilling and retraining um, is, a, is a bit of a gap. How we boost apprenticeships beyond the um, uh, incentives that the government's introduced as well um, and then also about job creation some really good stuff but it feels like we're going to need to do more on that as we go through um, the summer and into the autumn um, so lots more to do and even with those things that have been announced announcing something doesn't mean that it happens the delivery is actually the critical thing and that's where I think everybody on this um, uh, convention along with lots of other local and national partners will be really critical um, as well. So I think our partnership approach is going to be really critical. Um, we're looking forward to working with all of you um, on this and other things as well. Um, so please do get in touch with us if you've got ideas about that or um, ideas about future events or, or how we can add to how we um, do these events. Um, we will be able to meet again at some point and to, um, to sort of physically see each other um, face to face. But I think actually through this crisis, we've learned that some of these virtual events can be really useful and helpful as well. So I think we as an organisation will be looking to do a mixture of the two. Um, so thank you very much to all of the sponsors, all of the speakers and everybody who's uh, taken part in the convention today. Um, we look forward to working with you in the future. Um, so thank you very much and enjoy the rest of your day.